so much, worship team, for leading us in singing this morning. Thank you for singing along with them. You can open your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10, if you're using one of the Bibles in the seats, it's on page 7. Genesis chapter 10, and actually we're going to get into chapter 11 this morning as well. The big news this week, what was the big news this week? You remember the new ad, the ad, <laughs> South Dakota's new anti methamphetamine ad and slogan. I'm sure you could probably all say, we could probably say it together, meth, we're on it, right? I'm sorry, I'm not trying to reopen a wound, I'm not trying to stir up anything here this morning. The whole thing, it blew up, didn't it? Kind of blew up in our faces, literally. Blew up on social media, local news, made national news. CBS this morning ran a story on this commercial that was running in the state of South Dakota. By the end of the day, on Tuesday, right, it had been discussed, it had been joked about, it had been memed to death, right? Memes all over social media and all the rest. My favorite, I think, was the picture of Mike Tyson that said, don't meth with South Dakota. <laughs> My wife had been driving around town and said that there was a used car dealership that had its sign that said, our prices are so low, you think, you'll think we're on meth. <laughs> Many people were very quick to criticize the slogan. They said it was insensitive, sent the wrong message, joking about something that was very serious. And just as many were as quick to defend it as thought-provoking, effective, the campaign was an instant topic of much conversation in our community. Our kids discussed it at school. We talked about it as a staff in our church staff meeting. I got heated. We discussed it as a, as a family around our supper table. The, the campaign, the slogan, were, were definitely the source of a lot of discussion, a lot of confusion, a lot of division, and, and even just a little bit of hostility. And the interesting thing I thought about this this week was it's all over words. It's words. The Bible tells us that, the, that words are very powerful, aren't they? We're supposed to be careful with them. We're supposed to be careful with words. We, we struggle to understand each other, don't we? And we speak the same language. And we struggle to communicate. We struggle to understand what we mean when we use our words. And it, it divides us and it separates us. And it causes hostility among people. It's all words. It's language. Now consider the fact that there are an estimated 7,000 known distinct languages in the world today. That we know of. It's no wonder that we're so divided and there's so much disunity in the world. We can't even sit down and talk together. But I was wondering, I was thinking about this this week. Is, is, that, the, is that the root cause? Is the root cause of all of this disunity and brokenness and hostility and division that we see in, in relationships, personal relationships or in our own communities or in our own country or in the world is the root cause of all of that just simply a failure to communicate well. Is that the root cause of it? Like if we could all just speak the same language, would we be better off? Would all of these problems just disappear? Certainly they might get better, but would they all just immediately disappear? Would the world just become a perfect place? We could all just speak the same language, understand each other what we were saying? We're going to see the real root cause of disunity, the real root cause of division, the real root cause of hostility in our passage this morning. It's the result of a much more serious issue. And only by resolving that much more serious issue will the issue of disunity truly be resolved. So we're going to do something here, a little out of the ordinary here this morning. I told you to turn to chapter 10, but I'm actually going to ask you to skip to chapter 11. And we're going to start in chapter 11, verse 1, and I'm going to read to verse 9. And as is our tradition, I'm going to ask you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. I'm going to read these nine verses, and then I'm going to have you sit, and then we'll continue. And I'll go back and cover chapter 10 very briefly this morning. But follow along in 
chapter 11, as I read, these are the words of God. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen, that is tar, for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come. Let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off the building of the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Let's pray. Father, your word tells us that you oppose the proud and you give grace to the humble. May we in these moments, Father, humble ourselves under your mighty hand that at the proper time, the time that you deem proper, right, and fitting, that you may exalt us as sons and daughters of the living God under the lordship of Christ. Help us, Father, to understand our place in this story. Would you please do a work by your spirit through the preaching of your word and magnify Christ. I pray this in his name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, I'm reading this out of order kind of for two reasons. One is to be merciful to you because chapter 10 is long. And secondly, Moses, who wrote the book of Genesis, we believe, scholars believe, Moses wrote the book of Genesis. Moses wrote Genesis thematically, thematically, not necessarily chronologically. And being sort of the, the type A person that I am and with sort of my, my engineering mind, I like things in order chronologically. And so that's why I chose to read this in the way that I did. Now, Genesis chapter 10, if you look back at it, you see that the world is, is now filling up with, with people. So we just read about this, the story of the tower. People were of one speech, one language. And now we see the world is filling up not just with, with people, with individual people, but with distinct peoples, with nations of peoples. Thematically speaking, this is the fulfillment of the, the blessing that God had placed on Noah back in chapter 9. When God blessed Noah and his sons and he said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Last week we saw in Genesis 9 again, the sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. These were the three sons of Noah. From these, the people of the whole earth were dispersed. So thematically speaking, it makes sense to put chapter 10 where it is here in the story. The purpose of chapter 10 is stated in verse 1, picking up on the theme now. These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. And then at the end of chapter 32, it's even summarized again. From these, the nations were spread abroad. Or you could say were dispersed on the earth after the flood. That's, that's really the summary of chapter 10. The nations, the peoples, were then spread abroad. Moses felt burdened to show with great detail that the entire human race could trace its ancestry back to this one family, Noah and his 
three sons. In fact, if you count up all these names, which I'm going to read in just a moment, you count all these different names up, these different names, these nations listed here, the total number is 70, 70 different names. That's a very special, very unique number in the Bible. It signifies totality, completeness. You've heard it said, should I forgive? Should we forgive our, someone who sins against me seven times? And Jesus says, 70 times seven, not meaning just 70 times seven, but always. That's what that number signifies. It's totality, it's completeness. Literally, what Moses is trying to show here is all the nations, all of the nations of the earth are in view. Okay? The biblical worldview testifies that even today, the human race is one giant family. 7.5 billion members and growing, right? No matter what race or ethnicity, what language is spoken, what nationality, what color of skin, or how far apart we live geographically, we are one crazy global family, right? And like all large families, Noah's family was complicated. Maybe your family is a little complicated. Noah had a complicated family. And so let's look at it quickly in Genesis chapter 10. Starting in verse 2, the sons of Japheth. Now, Japheth was the middle child. Are there any middle childs in the room? Any middle childs? So, you'll appreciate the fact that Japheth is only mentioned very briefly. <laughs> only a little bit is said about Japheth, this, this middle child, Japheth. Whose sons were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tiras. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, Rephath, Togarma, the sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. And from these, the coastland peoples spread in their lands, each with his own language by their clans in their nations. So that's Japheth, the, the middle child. And then we move on to the, to the baby of the family, Ham. Any babies of the family? The youngest? All right, you undisciplined rascals, right? <laughs> A rowdy bunch of hooligans, the sons of Ham. In fact, it almost seems like as we read this, every villain and scoundrel in the Bible, it would seem, could be traced back to Ham. Follow along as I read in verse 6. The sons of Ham were Cush, Egypt. We recognize Egypt. They would be a thorn in the side of Israel. Put Canaan. We saw Canaan last week. Cursed be Canaan. The sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Rama, Sabteca. <coughs> The sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dedan. Cush fathered Nimrod. Now that's important. I'm going to take this little aside, this little parenthetical statement about Nimrod. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on the earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And then Erech, Akkad, Kalna. In the land of Shinar. From that land he went into Assyria. And he built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ur, Kela, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kela. That is the great city. We recognize Nineveh if you're familiar with the story of Jonah. Nineveh, that great city. Egypt fathered Ludim, Anamim, Lehabim, Naphtahim, Pathrusim, Kazluhim. From whom the Philistines came. And captured him. Then we get to Canaan. Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites, and the Girgashites, and the Hivites, and the Archites, and the Sinites, the Arvidites, the Zimmerites, and the Hamathites. They sound like termites. Pesky. <laughs> and the territory of the Canaanites extended from Sidon in the direction of Gerar as far as Geza, and in the direction of Sodom and Gomorrah. We recognize those two cities as being significant in the story of the Bible. Adma and Zeboim as far as Laisha. These are the sons of Ham. By their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. And then, of course, we get to Shem, the firstborn, the golden child. Any firstborns in the room? Confident. <laughs> leaders. 
can do no wrong, right? My wife and I are both firstborns. <laughs> Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, right? The golden child, the firstborn, from whom line would eventually be born Abraham, whose descendants would outnumber the stars. This is Shem. Verse 21, to Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the elder brother of Japheth, children were born. The sons of Shem, Elam, Asher, Arpaxid, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram, Uz, Hul, Gether, and Mash. Arpaxid fathered Shelah, and Shelah fathered Eber. To Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg. Make note of that name, Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. And his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan fathered Almadad, Shelef, Hazar Maveth, Jira, Hadoram, Uzal, Dikla, Obal, Abimael, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan. The territory in which they lived extended from Mesha in the direction of Sephar to the hill country of the east. These are the sons of Shem by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. And then the final summary, these are the clans of Noah. Here they are. Here's the family. The clans of Noah, according to their genealogies, in their nations, and from these the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. So here's Noah's family, an extensive growing family, a mixed blessing. Some are going to go on to greatness. Some are going to go on to be trouble. Just a normal human family. And don't quote me on any of the pronunciation of those names, by the way. I was always told is that you just say it with confidence. <laughs> just pretend like you know. Now, every family, as you know, has a history. Every family has a, has a backstory. Maybe you've dug into some of that in your own family. Done some research. Gone a, gotten an account on Ancestry.com or whatever. And you figured out and tried to piece together the backstory of your own family. Well, Genesis 11, which we began reading. Genesis 11, verses 1 through 9, is the backstory of Genesis 10. So if you're reading these in the, in the order that it's in your Bible... You see in chapter 10, mentioned several times in verses 5 and 20 and 31, you mentioned separate languages, separate nations. But then chapter 11 begins, now the whole earth had one language and the same words. The reason for that is that the Tower of Babel, this story now that we're going to unpack, is the backstory to all of chapter 10. It's why I read it in the order that I did, in the chronological order. And we have a hint of this. Hints are given in Genesis 10, verses 8 to, 8 to 10. I pointed that out as I read it. One particular descendant of Noah is, is separated, is, is, stands out from the rest. This man named Nimrod, right? Cush, who was the son of Ham, fathered Nimrod. He was the first on the earth to be a mighty man. This man of renown. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. He had a reputation. It is said. There were sayings about this Nimrod. Like Nimrod. A mighty hunter before the Lord. This was a saying. He had a reputation. He had made a name for himself. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. In the land of Shinar. Now the name Nimrod means we shall rebel. That's what the name Babel means. We shall rebel. And Babel, you might be more familiar with the Greek form of Babel, which is Babylon. A city that is notorious and becomes synonymous with idolatry and even captivity. So here, human strength and rebellion are the two pillars of Nimrod's sort of little fledgling kingdom here. And then Genesis 11, verses 1 through 9, are now going to explain the ripple effect of this, this little kingdom of Nimrod. 
built on human strength with rebellion at the heart of it. And so chapter 11 takes us back to the time when shortly after the flood, the whole earth was still unified, still under one language and had the same words. And I pointed out to you when I read chapter 10, if you look again at verse 25 and you wonder, well, when did it all fall apart? The clue is given to us in verse 25, in the days of Peleg. In the days of Peleg. For in his days, the earth was divided. So you can imagine this, this unified family that is growing in number, still with one language. And then in the days of, of Peleg, something happened. It evidently coincides with the establishment of this kingdom of Babel or Babylon. They decided they needed a project, something to do, something to pass the time, I don't know, in the plain of Shinar. And so they said in verse 3, to one another, come, let's make bricks. Let's get busy. Let's make bricks. Let's burn them or bake them thoroughly. And then they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Now, right away, we need to observe that these were substandard building materials. Baked bricks and tar. Nothing like cut Palestinian stone and actual mortar. So a person reading this would say, baked bricks and tar? That's what they're going to use? The whole scene is supposed to look silly. It's supposed to look like a bunch of kids who went down to the basement and they're going to build a fort with cardboard boxes and cushions from the couch. That's what it's supposed to look like. Childish. Bricks. Tar. But the question is, why are they coming together to make bricks at all? Well, evidently, as their numbers begin to grow, so did their fears. As their numbers begin to grow, so did their fears. They said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So their fears are growing. And here's two fears that I observe in that statement. Ones that we can, I think, relate to, immediately relate to. Their first fear was of insignificance. I don't want to be forgotten. Let's make a name for ourselves. This impulse to do something great. To do something important. To do something that's impressive. At least in their own eyes. I mean, what's the point of existence? Right? If we don't do something important, something impressive, something that leaves a legacy, what's the point? I mean... We're just going to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth with image bearers of God. Is that all we have to do? Is that it? Just obey God and his command. Is that all we have to do? Just be faithful to God's call on our, on our lives and keep our eyes on him. Is that all we have to do? Or can we come up with something better than that? God and his word and his calling and his blessing were not enough for them. They needed something more for themselves. They needed an accomplishment. They wanted to be remembered. They needed to be significant. That was their fear. The fear of anonymity, the fear of obscurity, insignificance. It all comes down to just the good old fashioned P word, right? Pride. That's what it is. It's human pride. God is not enough. His word isn't enough. His calling isn't enough. We need something more. We need to be significant in and of our own right. Now, the other big fear was that of isolation. So insignificance was one fear. Isolation was the other. Lest we be dispersed over the face of the earth. They feared being spread out. They feared being alone. They feared being exposed and threatened. They didn't, they didn't trust God to keep them safe. They didn't trust him to be their refuge and their fortress. 
They didn't trust God to be their provider. They needed security, protection. Let's come together. Let's do this together, right? Now, what they were, who they were afraid of, I couldn't tell you. There wasn't anyone else out there but themselves. But the truth is, our fears are often irrational, aren't they? We're often afraid of things that aren't really out there at all. These same two impulses, the, the fear of insignificance and the fear of isolation, exposure, those, those same impulses drive us today, don't they? America is built on those two impulses. We need to feel significant and we need to feel safe. When God offers both of those freely to us, but we simply don't trust him. Rather than humbly rest in a gracious and loving, omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent, everywhere creator, pride, pride brought the people together. Not worship, they didn't gather to worship him. Pride brought them together to build for themselves a great city. And in the center of that great city would be an impressive tower. And the purpose of that tower is to reach God, to reach God in the heavens. They literally thought of God as the big man upstairs all the way back then. He's just the big man upstairs in his big office with his big desk. And we're going to get to him. If we simply work hard, if we give it our best team effort, and you know what team stands for, right? Together, everyone achieves more. We'll make it up to him. We reach high enough and we can ascend to God and we can stand in his holy presence on our own terms. That's the purpose of this tower. What this tower says is they clearly thought very little of God. They had a, a conception of God. God is very small. And they thought an awful lot of themselves. And you're on dangerous ground when you start thinking that way, aren't we? So we start thinking that way. When we get things flipped around this way, that is when, when God becomes small and we become big in our own eyes, we are in serious trouble. That's the warning here. And this is where things get massively off track. Big people with a little God. But God saw it. He caught it. He put a stop to it. He, he cut him off at the pass. Right? Verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower. Which the children of man. Now that was chosen on purpose. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. I just love that verse. This great city that mankind had built to make a name for themselves, to protect them, to keep them safe, this impressive tower, the centerpiece of this great city that they had made, this tower that would enable them to climb their way up to the heavens and access God on their own terms, in their own way, in their own time. It was also inadequate. It was just so pitiful that God, from the heavens, he couldn't even see it. He just couldn't even see it. The Lord had to come down to see. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower. The the picture that comes to mind is somebody who's getting down on their hands and their knees and putting their nose all the way to the floor trying to say, where is it? Where is the city and this tower that you built to reach up to me? Let's go down and look. Imagine the Trinity in, in heaven having this discussion. I heard they built a city. Did you hear they built a city? It's really cute. This little tower they built to reach up to us. Well, where is it? 
I don't see it. No, it's there. Look, it's there. That's it. That's the impressive thing. That's the thing they're going to reach up to me with. That thing. Where is it? We're like children. Cute children building a fort. Taking their cardboard boxes and their couch cushions and trying to build something that seems impressive in their own sight. As far as God was concerned, it was, it was amateurish at best. And it, it would be hysterical, frankly, from God's point of view, if it wasn't also simultaneously incredibly concerning to God. And God expressed this concern in verse 5. So I think, I think in verse 5, this is God expressing his I think, he's, he's, I think he's literally laughing at them. Psalm 2, verse 4 says, He who sits in the heavens laughs. I think God is laughing at what is taking place here, but he's also concerned in verse 6. He says, Behold, they're one people. They have one language. And this, this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning of what they will do. And nothing they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Now, God is not concerned about himself. He's concerned about them. He's concerned about us. Once the proud child determines that he can actually reach God on his own, the next most logical step will be for him to declare that he is God. Left with our pride unchecked, we will effectively replace God. That's what pride means. Pride is replacing God with ourselves. And that's exactly what the lying serpent had said to Eve in the garden. You will be like God. That's a lie. You won't need him anymore. You'll be like him. You won't need him. And nothing will be impossible for you. That's a lie. Rejecting the true and living God who made us and loves us. And then replacing him and becoming in our own minds, our own gods. That is the fundamental root and cause of all of our problems. And this is simply not something that God can allow to succeed. This is the lie that leads to death. And God loves us way too much. If God were to allow us to live that lie, it would be the most unloving thing that God could do. So he doesn't, he doesn't allow it to proceed. Now he could have come down and he could have destroyed them, couldn't he? Could have just stomped his big God foot on the whole thing and it could have been over. But in this case, God's gracious solution was to confuse their language the very thing that kept them together and then subsequently scatter them as different nations all over the face of the earth confuse and scatter that's what Babel means Babel means confuse and then he scattered them he sent them away it's interesting to notice the parallels between the story of Noah and the story of Adam, isn't it? He sent them away. He scattered them. As different nations all over the face of the earth. Which, incidentally, is exactly what they were afraid would happen, isn't it? That's what they, that's what they didn't want to have happen. And God, God gave them over to their fear of being dispersed over all the earth. Practically speaking, this confusion of their language. Now, I don't know exactly how that came about. They're all just talking, and then instantly, at the snap of their snap of God's fingers, suddenly, they're all under, not able to understand each other. I don't know how the confusion of their language came about, but it weakened their ability to come together as one people, to rise up in rebellion against God as one people. And then they just left it off. They left off the building of the city and the tower. They just abandoned their work. Now, the confusion of their speech was practical, but it was also symbolic of an even deeper issue. The people were already confused, weren't they? They were already confused, and their ultimate confusion was about God. They lacked a proper understanding and reverence for who God was. Therefore, God took from them the one thing keeping them unified in this ultimate confusion, which was their speech. The one thing that's keeping them all together, keeping them in solidarity, 
in their rebellion against God, God took that away. He took away their speech. That way, they couldn't be confused about God together anymore. So from Babel, the people would go all their separate directions. You see that in chapter 10, developing their own languages, many of them their own false and distorted views of God. And evidently, from God's point of view, thousands of inadequate, false religions scattered all over the world was better than one global false religion. Apostasy, where nothing seemed impossible to them. So to this day, the world is filled with thousands of languages, but more seriously, it's filled with innumerable religions that distort the truth and lie about God. <coughs> you say it this way, without a proper understanding of God, there can be no real unity. The solution to all of the division and the disunity and the hostility in our world is not to sit down and try harder to understand one another, to fix our communication problems. The ultimate solution, what will usher in true unity and peace on earth is people and peoples turning their lives over to God and humbling themselves under his mighty hand. The one true and living God. Any effort to unify people that does not have reconciliation with God as its ultimate goal will fail. It won't work. That unity will be superficial, it will be manipulative, and it won't last. It certainly won't last for eternity when the permanent division of humanity occurs. Real unity can only be found in relationship to God. And that was the mission of Jesus. The mission of Jesus is to bring us back to God. Together. One of the glorious realities of the gospel, which we love. We love the gospel. So many glorious realities that come from it. Is that in Christ, God is unscattering the nations. And he is calling them in. From the four corners of the earth. God is calling the nations. He's calling them to Christ. He's calling them to Jesus. Jesus came down into the world once and for all to, to undo the mess. That fear and distrust and pride and arrogance caused at Babel. Jesus came to undo it. He came down. Man was trying to build his way up. But Jesus came down. He came down to undo the confusion about God. Because he is the image of the invisible God. All confusion about God ends when we come to Jesus. The deep lines of division and hostility that began to be drawn in Genesis 11 are being erased as the gospel spreads and as Christ's church is built. This is why the Apostle Paul, in his epistles, this is why he could write things like this, like to the church of Galatia, where he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's no division anymore. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. You are all one. In Christ, not divided, not separate. Christ is not divided, he is one. And you are one in Christ. Speaking to the church in Ephesus, Jews and Gentiles, again, struggling to be unified, Paul exhorted them with this gospel truth. But now, now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, Going all the way back to Genesis 11. You who were once far off, dispersed, have been brought near. You've been brought in by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. Who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh. The dividing wall of hostility. That he might create in himself 
one new man, one new human race. So making peace. And he might reconcile us to God in one body through the cross. Killing the hostility. And once the work of creating this, this one new man, this one new human race through the spreading of the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's the work of missions, by the way. Spreading this gospel to the ends of the earth is the work of missions. That's why we as a church support missions heavily. Sending missionaries to spread the news about Jesus to the ends of the earth. Once that work is completed, this new unified humanity will gather in the last day. John saw it. The book of Revelation, you, you know this verse, hopefully you do, Revelation 7, and this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude, a great unified multitude, one man, one new human race, this great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, all of them standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Salvation belongs to our God. This is the final undoing of Babel. Revelation 7, 9 is the undoing of Babel, a reconstituted humanity united around the throne of God singing praises for all eternity to the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the glorious reality that when Jesus returns, that we will be gathered with all the redeemed around this throne, your throne, singing praises to the Lamb. Salvation belongs to our God. Father, would you let the nations be glad? Would you be spreading the gospel of your kingdom to the ends of the earth? That the end might come, this glorious end, this reconstituted humanity, this one new human race from every peoples, every nation, every language, every tongue. Would you build your church through the spreading of your gospel? Father, we lift up our global partners, those who are working overseas. Father, we pray for them. The great work that they're doing of spreading the gospel to the ends of the earth. We pray Give them endurance. Give them perseverance. Help them to see that what they're doing matters. Reconstituting this divided, disunified people. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing around the world through the work of missions. Father, help us to be involved. Show us how, God, we can support this great work of reunifying the whole world under Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand?